After the surprise Japanese military air attack on United States ships and airfields at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii on December 7, 1941, the United States joined its allies in World War II, a global war that had started two years earlier when the Nazis invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. The principal allies of the United States were the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union and China, who were fighting the Axis countries, Nazi Germany, Japan, and Italy. Once the United States joined the war, nearly 16 million men enlisted in the Army, Army Air Forces, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. Beginning in 1933, with his rise to power in Germany, Hitler sought to marginalize, humiliate, and segregate Jews and destroy Jewish life in every occupied country. The Nazis developed a complex system of concentration, labor, and death camps to which millions of Jews were deported and murdered. In all the camps, the conditions were grossly unsanitary. Prisoners were forced into overcrowded barracks in which disease festered and food was scarce. Many prisoners starved to death or were worked to death, died from disease, beatings, or gruesome medical experiments. Countless prisoners were shot, hanged, or sent to gas chambers. The world eventually knew of the existence of the camps and Hitler's goal to annihilate the Jewish population of Europe, but the true depth and depravity of the conditions were not widely publicized. In many cases, the mass killings were not believed. On June 6, 1944, the militaries of the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom undertook the largest naval, air, and land operation in history to invade continental Europe with the goal of liberating the countries occupied by Nazi Germany. General Dwight Eisenhower was the supreme Allied commander of the D-Day invasion. Thousands of soldiers landed on five beachheads on the coast of Normandy, France to battle the German army. The Allies marched east through France and then into Germany. Although soldiers knew about German prisoner of war camps, most had no knowledge of the concentration camps in Germany. The soldiers were unprepared to find camps with Jewish civilian prisoners dead or barely alive in the most unimaginable inhumane conditions. In the spring of 1945, United States troops liberated Dachau, Buchenwald, Dora Mittelbau, Flossenburg, and Matthausen. General Eisenhower ordered all troops in the areas near the liberated camps to see them, take photographs, and make films because he wanted to prevent future generations from denying what the Nazis did to Jews and other prisoners in the camps. General Eisenhower and other officers also ordered local German people in the towns near the camps to come view the conditions and bury the bodies found by the United States troops. The soldiers who liberated the camps were so shocked by what they saw that most were unable to talk about it for years after World War II ended until Holocaust deniers started becoming more vocal. American liberators of the camps realized that as witnesses, they had an obligation to share the truth of the Nazis' inhumanity to fellow human beings. In this video, you will see and hear firsthand testimony from nine United States Army veterans who liberated the concentration camps of Buchenwald, Ordruff, a subcamp of Buchenwald, Dora Mittelbau, another subcamp of Buchenwald, and Dachau. The veterans in this film generously gave their time for many years to speak to students and educators through the Esther Robb Holocaust Museum and Goodwin Education Center in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Now that most of the World War II generation of veterans is gone, this video will restore their voices and their important experiences as witnesses to the Holocaust, specifically to the horrors of the Nazi concentration camps. We are grateful to the following United States Army veterans of World War II for their bravery in battle and for their courage and conviction in sharing their liberation stories. Andrew Tim Canary, Abraham Al Yesser, Anthony Marone, William McCool, William Bilek, Irving Brown, Philip DiGiorgio, James Bird, and Arthur Seltzer. We went to Nora, which is right outside of uh, Weimar, which is close to Buchenwald. We set up there. 
for a couple days, and then we went into Buchenwald. When we went to Nor, we when we went to Nor, then we took a day trip into Buchenwald. Tell me about uh, your reaction when you first entered Buchenwald. Just unbelievable to see the you, you couldn't you, you couldn't to me there was so much of it you couldn't grasp at all. It was just see these people standing there. You see the bodies. You see the the ashes. You see this, the, the, the 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 ditches. It just it just. Uh, uh, I can't. I can't really describe it to tell you. You know what? How horrendous it was to see these people treated like like animals. You might say even worse than that. Even worse than that. And to, and to see that. I mean, and the and I the the, uh, the people in Weimar, which I think was about nine miles from there, said they didn't know anything about this. The stench. And the wind had to take that stench that far. You know, it was just that couldn't you, you can't believe we. Uh, and Patton, I think it was Patton, because uh, I think that came under the Third Army because we had I think we had moved into the Third Army. Uh, Patton brought I don't know how many people out of Weimar, marched them down there, to show them what we'd known. They said they didn't know anything about it. It's hard. To, it's hard to believe. It's just hard to believe. And I say, we went in there, when it was a hospital unit, we took German people and, and finished cleaning what hadn't been cleaned up. And there was still a lot to be cleaned, believe me, a lot. Took German people. We supervised the cleaning up of that. Our, our sanitation department supervised the cleaning up of that, uh, the grounds of that camp. I, I it's just uh, it's something I can't really describe what you saw when you went in there. Uh, did you help supervise the uh, digging of graves? Graves. The what? Digging of graves. There were graves. There were tr tr trenches with bodies in them. You know, it's. It, it, how do you how do you do this? How do you how do you live with yourself and do this? You know. To me, the severest pun punishment going is not severe enough for the people that uh, that did this. Of course, I know, you know, and I, people say, well, and I agree with they were they were doing it under orders, but I, I don't know. I don't know whether I could do it or whether I'd be be one to uh, make let them shoot me or whatever. I don't know. I, I, it's something I would have to be dealt with at a time. You know what I'm saying? But some of those people and reading the book, some of those uh, those officers. Had no compassion for for any no life at all. But they they, they I say the graves, the pile of ashes, the pile of bones, the people, the the the, the carts with the bodies on them. It's, you know, it's it's just unreal that somebody could do that. That's the best I can describe of what what we saw that day. I say we went in there as a, as a unit. And we did our job. You know, I say we got a citation for it. I mean, they, they, they talked about the, you know, the way we, we people they, we, they brought in, they were brought in on a stretcher to the ward, and we transferred them. We transferred them with care. You know, we, they, these people were hurting. I mean, they were in bones. I mean, you couldn't. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. You know, they were fragile. They were uh, the way they were talking. They told me that it was just a regular camp. Looking at it, you would think that it was, but the smell, as you got close to it, you realized something was wrong. Something just didn't jive. It was a, an odor that uh, even on the battlefield, it wasn't that smell. But I went back and I had to stay for three days waiting for the medical corps to come. Uh, to take care of the prisoners, and we had to do the best we could with them. And we went back into the officers' barracks in order to feed some of them and uh, whatever we could, but there was not enough. The uh, prisoners were in very bad shape, just skin and bones. And I can remember one prisoner getting out of his bunk and coming over to me very joyfully 
because he realized he was being fed from the prison and he hugged me and before I could do anything, he fell down and he died right there in that. Took us through the gates of Bougainville. We saw these bodies stacked like lumber. I couldn't believe the sight. I'd see where it's in that I'd seen death bodies before, but never like this. There were truck body loose scattered, piled all over the place. And one of the inmates took us through the barracks, and there were the road. The smell was just un unbelievable, un unbearable. I had never smelled like that before. With the human body, not only the death but the living. There were men there that couldn't get out of their bunks. They were so weak, and uh, we saw these. They're like skeleton like. And it was just, just, just a sight. It couldn't sight. Couldn't. We're, uh, we were taken through the different barracks, and uh, this one building had been a stable, and uh, they, re they converted the stable to barracks. There were like three or four guys to a bunk, and there were three tiers of men. And finally, we, we just called our captain and said, look, I want you to take, go around the area within a five or a mile, ten mile radius, pick up all the civilians, bring them here. Because they were denying anything, they, they were denying it, they didn't know what was going on. How could you deny when that smokestack has gone there and you smell it for miles? So we took the, the people through the camp, took them all around, and one woman smiled when she, she smiled. I don't know what she was laughing about. So the captain said, take her through again. Then when we got finished, we had all the men, and men gave them shovels, let them dig the body, bury the bodies. And there were, like I said, there were 20,000 20, survivors of which there were 900 teenagers. And I'm, I didn't know this, but one of the teenagers was Eli Wiesel. He was one of the teen teenagers that survived the camp. And uh, we immediately called headquarters. Of course, the first time we said, we need help here. That we need medics, we need food, we need supplies. There's a horrible condition here. And we, by mistake, we were feeding these people. And as we fed them, we killed them, because I didn't know this, but a person's starving, you should never feed them. I don't know anything about that. We didn't know, totally know. What really cleared me a lot through the whole thing in itself when we took Ordolf. When you had 12 nude, starved men crawling to you, Americana, Americana, you come and liberated us. It brought tears. It brought, I couldn't talk about it for about eight years. It, it just, it got, I couldn't believe the ovens. I couldn't believe, I mean, I'm glad now that I'm able to talk and tell you positively, how could anybody take women and men, teenagers, Archwit, Ordov, Dachau, all those camps, it was sickening. It was absolutely sickening. And I'm, I'm, I'm really actually glad that I was able to save lives. I went in the first day. The first, see, the, in the morning, <clears throat> the troops that uh, actually liberated them, I wouldn't say we liberated them, uh, that were in there was in the morning. And we went in eh, in the afternoon sometime. So the general used us to maintain order and make sure that uh, nobody escapes and that uh, the, the Germans do what they're told. So General Collins, now this is interesting too. Uh, general Collins uh, told us, make sure that uh, Every German in Nordhausen that can carry a body come to the camp and 
he made the Germans, all able Germans, everybody in Nordau, dig a massive grave in the best part of North. Did you ever hear this before? Massive grave. In fact, like a trench. Right? Trench. And it was about a mile from the camp. And the Germans never knew about it. <laughs> when we came in there, you could smell it, smell human burning flesh. I'd say five miles. You could, you could smell it. So when we went in there, I, I was so shocked. It affected me even more than it did on D-Day because of the, well, you, you saw the pictures. I never saw anything like that before. It, can you imagine how, how you feel, say, seeing this for the first time? So anyway, he said, every German will dig the grave. And he said, and, and it was between about a mile, I'd say, I don't know how much exactly, from the camp to the grave. He said, take the body in your arms, no cover. You saw in what condition they were, a lot of them were falling apart. He said, carry each body through the town and gently lay the body in the grave. And this, can you imagine that line, you know, with all the stuff? I wish I had a picture of that. I didn't take a picture of that. From there to there. And they took all the bodies and reverently laid them in the grave. It was good, so the, the general, but you know, our guns were cocked as we made sure that they did that. Uh, we were making uh, great strides. Uh, the, the resistance on the part of the, the German army was crumbling, and we were moving at great speed uh, in south uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, our, our aim was to capture the city of Munich. And we were on our way toward the city of Munich when uh, I got a call on the radio uh, to bring some heavy equipment to a town called Dachau where there was a prison camp. Now I have to pause for a minute and tell you that we knew we knew about these prison camps. Uh, they had been, the information had leaked out uh, about their existence and about what they were doing there. And uh, so we were, we, we were kind of prepared a little bit for what we saw later on. But I gotta tell you, reading about it in, in the Stars and Stripes, Stars and Stripes was a, a, an army newspaper that was published in Europe and uh, it ran articles about things concerning the troops. And one of the things, they, one of the stories they ran occasionally was, was some, what, what people heard about these camps. But reading about it in the, in the newspaper uh, was, uh, was a far cry from actually seeing what was going on. Uh, the call on the radio said that the camp, there was a train that was parked in the camp and it was blocking traffic. Uh, military traffic, and the idea was to uh, was to get rid of the train. Well, we happened to have a lot of heavy equipment, bulldozers, and things like that. So the, our commanding officer dispatched a few of us. I was one of them to go to the camp, uh, reconnoiter the situation, and decide what kind of equipment we had to bring back to to take care of this train. By the way, the the people the the people of Dachau in the village. The, Dachau is a, is a little village a lot like some of the villages are in, in, in South Jersey here. Um, they claimed not to know what was going on here, but I can tell you that from the smell, the stench, that's one of the first things we noticed when we came to the camp, how badly it smelled. And the smoke that came out of this chimney, that had been, this process had been going on for years, they certainly had to know something about what was going on, although they, they denied it. Uh, I told you about this train. Uh, <clears throat> the train consisted of 40 cars, minus an engine. What happened to the engine? I don't know. But 40 cars all linked together, and they were indeed spread over the street that was blocking traffic. 
So the, our first mission was to go inspect the train and see what we could do about it. But when we climbed up on the cars, we noticed that the train was filled with dead bodies. And we went from car to car to car looking for survivors. Because we didn't know how this had happened. And, and to this day, I don't know, I can speculate that what might have taken place was that these people were brought in from some other camp. Or perhaps they were trying to load these people on the train and take them away from the camp. But whatever happened, they were left on the cars in a dying condition, and they all ultimately died. Now, uh, I've got to tell you, we, were, we had been through a campaign starting in Europe in 1944. There had been a lot of bloody fighting. We lost a lot of good people, and we were used to seeing death. But we were not prepared for this. This was something over and above anything in a wartime setting. I, I just, I got almost sick looking at this because it, you can't imagine how cruel the, 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 the camp, the people who ran the camp were to these inmates. And, and when, you, when they talk about six million people being slaughtered, and, and that I can believe it because what, what I saw was just a few hours worth of this. On one morning, on April the 29th in 1945, I saw one little slice of history. And you multiply that up by <clears throat> all the other months of, of, the, of the duration of Hitler's regime, and you get a f pretty fair idea of the extent of this, this crime. We had no idea that the camp re uh, existed. We had been fighting, chasing, running, shooting, and uh, I, we had no idea it was there. And like I said, when I, when I saw these 38 freight cars all filled with bodies, I said, oh my God, with man's inhumanity to man, it was unbelievable. And uh, I shall never forget it. Do you remember how you felt? Oh my God, we were just, we were just in awe, you know? And they were so happy to see us. And like a lot of them are so bad that we couldn't feed them. We couldn't give them K-Rats or anything. The rear echelon came up and they took care of them medically. But uh, oh, they were happy to see us. And I was there at Dachau when I think I saw an elephant fly because it was a very cold day on April 30th. There were snow flurries. And we went there with two truckloads of GIs of, of my group. And we first thing that we saw was the train outside on the siding that was loaded with box cars and gondola cars with a lot of dead bodies. There was only one survivor in that train load of people. It left North Germany from a camp up there 23 days before with 60 cars on it and over 6,000 people were jammed on that train and that they died all the way down through and there was only 40 cars, 39 cars left with all these dead bodies on it. Vision was suppressed in my mind for many years until after I retired. And then I became interested in what was going on, people saying that there was no Holocaust, that never happened, that this was a major part of the liberation of Dachau. There were some from the 42nd Division that arrived there by accident at another part of Dachau. <coughs> And the colonel in charge of the unit that went there, Felix Parks, he got this radio call that says, go to such and such place. And he went, and they had no knowledge of concentration camps prior to that. Of, well, maybe there was mention that different ones had been liberated. But when you're in a war like we were, you didn't pay attention to that stuff. And this uh, Dachau was liberated on the after, uh, morning and afternoon of April 29th. Which At that place, we heard about a camp. Now, from D-Day forward, the marching orders for the troops were always were to push the Germans back. And if we came across any prisoner war camps, were to free our troops that were in camp, 
those that could go back into battle, make sure they got back, those that need to be sent to hospitals, make sure, and so forth. So we never heard of concentration camps. And again, I'm not saying that other troops may have heard about them, but most of the American troops did not hear about concentration camps. When we took off from Munich to move forward, we were on a policing mission, and it was just a matter of time that uh, we would be uh, a war we were hoping were going to come to an end. And as we moved out of Munich and started towards a town called Dachau, uh, we were going through the fields and moving forward. And I happened to be riding in the half track at that time and pulling our trailer behind. And as I was looking through the field glasses forward, we saw in the distance Bob wire and we thought we saw a prisoner of war camp. And as we got uh, kept on moving, I asked a couple of the men in my unit, I says, take a look, Is that, it looked like a prisoner of war camp. And they said they thought it was also. But as we got closer, one of the gentlemen who had the field glasses, he said, uh, hey, Sergeant, take a look. Uh, these guys seem to have funny uniforms. And I said, uh, well, maybe they have prisoner of war uniforms. And normally our soldiers in prisoner of war camp kept their own uniforms. They were not given any uniform. So I looked through the field glasses and when I looked, I said, gee, they look like striped pajamas. I says, it looks like white and black from what I saw. And I says, yeah, it's funny. We're not getting any firing from up there neither. Uh, it seems awful quiet up there. And uh, as we kept on moving forward, and naturally we were with the uh, Seventh Armored, uh, sorry, I was attached to the 20th Armored at that time. And as we were moving forward, I says, gee, there's not much gunfire. Things are too quiet. Uh, we were following behind and naturally we were letting these tanks go first. We figured that's better support for us. We'll, we'll hang back a little bit in case something breaks out. And as we got close, real close, we see these iron gates and we see like shriveled up bodies standing up and up against this fence and all. And uh, naturally the commander in charge of uh, this group that's moving with the tanks uh, finally got to the gate. There was no resistance at all there. And we saw all these dead bodies lying around. And that was the first time that we have heard of a concentration camp. And the name of the concentration camp was called Dachau. And it was named for the town of Dachau, which is loaded, which is located not too far. You know, it's right down the street. And uh, again, a lot of information that I found out later after the war, I was able to find out about this camp. But at that time, we went into the camp, and when we saw these people, they looked half starved. And we didn't know. Uh, we took our K rations, and we start to give the K rations to these people that were half starved. and. At that time, the commander of the 20th uh, told us they had to use our communications to get back to Army headquarters immediately. And I didn't know at the time, but what they were communicating back was they wanted Eisenhower, they wanted all the big officers to come up to this camp because they felt that this was the first concentration camp that the United States Army had liberated. They thought, they weren't sure. And later on, uh, after the war was over, I found out that the 42nd Infantry, the 45th, and the 20th were involved in liberating this camp. This was on Sunday, 
uh, the 29th, 1945, that we came upon this camp. And when we got there, it was around noontime. And again, uh, it, was, it was unbearable what we saw there. And naturally, it was more unbearable for me because I was Jewish and to think that these people, they did nothing wrong except being Jewish, that they were killed. And again, the next day, which was Monday, we heard the sirens and naturally knew immediately Eisenhower was arriving at the camp. Now, being with the Signal Corps, uh, I was issued a camera way back along with my, and we were told any time anybody in the Signal Corps, not only our unit, all units, were told if they saw anything of, and especially of interest, they were to take pictures and made sure he got back to the Signal Corps. And again, most of this was used later on, as we found out. In fact, some of the pictures that were taken at Dachau were used in a movie at that time, uh, which recently uh, I just happened to see, which was The Trials of Nuremberg. And these pictures were used. <clears throat> at that time, I never knew they would be used, and I don't know if it was my pictures were used or whose pictures were used. But we did take pictures of this camp, of what was going on. And uh, General Eisenhower made sure that plenty of pictures were taken. He also called the mayor of Dachau to the camp, and he told him that he wanted the whole town to be brought to this camp. And this was uh, Monday. On Tuesday, all the townspeople were brought to the camp and they were made to go around this camp and take a look at what was going on there. And naturally, they all stated they didn't know what was going on there, which is hard for anyone to believe that the town is so close in not knowing what was going on there. <clears throat> 